LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Dmitry Orlov, who joins us to discuss the danger and opportunity of the 2020 coronavirus crisis. You can help cover my operating costs by visiting LegalizeFreedom.com, that's Legalize-Freedom.com, and clicking the Donate button. You can also follow me at Facebook.com forward slash LegalizeFreedom, YouTube.com forward slash LegalizeFreedom1, and Twitter at LegalizeFreedom. There is a lot happening in the world all at once right now. The entire planet is rapidly reconfiguring itself. The world is begging for a new post-capitalist, post-industrial order to be born. That's a quote from Orlov's latest book, The Meat Generation, published before the current crisis kicked off. The large-scale, hierarchically organised and centrally controlled systems in energy, industry, transport, health, banking, politics and more, upon which our modern societies depend, have once again proven dangerously unstable and inadequate when faced with serious challenges. In the case of the current coronavirus meltdown, the real crisis has been the fear, panic and craven capitulation with which so many have blindly reacted. Theories and speculation abound as to where all of this is taking us and just what a post-coronavirus future may hold. Based on events thus far, however, the wholesale compromise and loss of freedoms of speech, association, assembly and travel and the right to choose in healthcare appears entirely possible. Whatever happens, a comprehensive return to business as usual seems highly unlikely. The planet is indeed being reconfigured in ways that are only just beginning to make themselves known. Hello and welcome, Dimitri, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you. It's great to be with you again. Now, Dimitri, it's been a few years since we spoke. In fact, when we did last time, it was when your book, Shrinking the Technosphere, had just come out. And uh, my, you know, how things have moved on in the intervening period, shall we say. Before we jump into our discussion today, for listeners who don't know, uh, just tell people a little bit about your background and uh, your work. Uh, well, uh, my, ba- my background is in engineering. Um, I, I worked in, in high energy physics for a long time and uh, then I, I moved on to the internet um, and, and had a, a long and prosperous career in, in all sorts of internet related um, industry. And, and then eventually I, I, I pretty much gave, gave up on uh, corporate employment and moved aboard a, a sailboat and uh, sailed around with my wife and, and uh, we had a son and uh, who is now seven. Uh, when it was t- time for our son to go to school, we chose uh, St. Petersburg, Russia as the place to do that. So uh, now we're living in Russia. And um, um, in the meantime, I, I transitioned to being a writer and uh, I publish books and uh, I run uh, a blog uh, where I publish uh, at least one article a week. And that's been going pretty well. So I think I'll stick with that for the time being. Splendid. Well, a lot of things, concerns, topics that you've been writing about now for many years um, are coming into particularly sharp focus at the moment. Uh, We're recording this just in the early stages, probably, of the uh, coronavirus crisis of 2020. Just a quote from one of the sections in your, your latest book, which is called The Meat Generation. There is a lot happening in the world all at once right now. The entire planet is rapidly reconfiguring itself. The world is begging for a new post-capitalist, post-industrial order to be born, dot, dot, dot. That's a quote from you written some time before things began to unravel at the moment. So it's like, yeah, there's a lot happening right now in the world all at once. 
on steroids, basically. So what's your take? Uh, what sort of questions have you been feeling about what's going on at the moment? Well, um, I've been uh, watching the, the, the going, goings on, the development around the coronavirus crisis. And uh, it seems like uh, it, it's not that dire in terms of health. It's not that dire in terms of uh, uh, economic consequences, uh, but it is incredibly dire in terms of political consequences uh, because it is a stress test. And there have been a lot of uh, structures, political, mostly political structures, but also financial, because the two are, are so connected uh, that, that have been incredibly weak for a long time. That just the, these, uh, very large overblown organizations like the European Union or the United States um, that, that are just incredibly fragile. And what we're watching now is these very fragile uh, structures are, are disappearing. It turns out that they didn't really exist. They were right. some sort of a figment of some official's imagination. Uh, the, it was a sort of a theatrical suspension of disbelief that led us to believe that a structure like the European Union actually existed. And so the coronavirus is actually something that pulled the veil off the whole thing and, and, and made it obvious what's really going on. It's not, it's not really a prime mover of any sort. It's just, uh, it's, it's the trigger. Yeah. And, and if your take on it is accurate, then it was, I mean, it was something relatively little, but in, in and of itself, that did trigger this, but you can just see how you have enormous ripples from a, a relatively small pebble being chucked into the pond. Certainly the U.S. seems to be, well, it depends if you've been observing the U.S. in recent years, but for many people, they'll be looking at the U.S. right now and wondering how they're coping so badly with this. They would think, well, look at all the resources they've got, you know, and all the, all the people, all the knowledge, all the infrastructure, all the experience, why are they doing so badly? And just with the EU, actually, a lot of people, um, I've heard that the phrase missing in action used more than once about the EU and the current situation. Well, yes. Uh, if, you, if you look at how uh, they've been coping, the, the, the U.S. in particular, well, it, it's a, it's a health care related crisis. And health care in the United States has been in crisis ever since they decided that it was a bright idea to associate um, health care with employment. And that was the initial incredibly stupid idea. And it's been downhill from then on. So now, now we end up in a situation where millions of people will, will require um, medical care that in the American system will cost somewhere upwards of $100,000 per patient. And uh, just, just for, the, for the time they spend in the hospital hooked up to, uh, uh, to the, the uh, machinery, um, and under observation, even if if it's a mild case and doesn't really require um, a, a lot of uh, additional uh, care, uh, a lot of these people don't even have uh, health insurance. Uh, if they do, uh, they they can't uh, afford the so-called co-payment um, or the deductible or various other schemes where where through through which basically this predatory medical system robs people. So here's a country that was uh, comfortably robbing itself for a long time while well, things were okay, but now that things are not okay, it, it's basically uh, in a situation that it cannot, that, that is completely unworkable. That is, that there's, there's absolutely nothing that anyone there can do to suddenly reconfigure this system uh, along completely different lines um, and, and make it work. So suddenly they discover that nothing that they have will work. Now, a lot of people have talked about what's going on at the minute in terms of, uh, you know, a teachable moment when, when realizations of the sort you described might finally dawn um, on, on governments and um, institutions. So it's hard to imagine, of all the many things that might not return to business as usual, it's hard to imagine after all this, even if the impact, whether it's health or economically, whatever it happens to be, on, say, the U.S. is relatively modest, that they could go back to the healthcare system they had just as was, because surely it'll be obvious 
uh, you know, how easy it was for the whole thing to unravel. And, you know, it, it was doing that under its own weight anyway. So how do you, how do you see that in particular? Because as you say, other problems aside, it's the healthcare system in the US that's really shown to be the weakest link in an already weak chain. Well, it's just a good example because this is a healthcare crisis and uh, um, it's, uh, it's basically, it's destroying, a, a ripping apart a country that has a very faulty healthcare system. Um, various other countries may be slightly ahead. Um, Germany, for instance, uh, does have uh, a relatively solid um, health, public health care scheme. Um, but uh, there are other things that uh, will prevent any sort of restoration of status quo. And uh, the most important one is that the, the fracking industry is over. It's shutting down. It won't be restarted because uh, it, it started up as, a, as a, um, a, a resource exploitation scheme, a rather desperate one, because this, this is a very low-grade resource. The shale oil is, is uh, you know, no, nobody except the very desperate would, would ever think about exploiting it as a resource. And then it turned into a, a financial swindle because uh, um, – People, uh, companies could could uh, could raise money to exploit this resource uh, because of very low interest rates and because of pension funds and various other funds looking for anything at all with a yield, um, basically to prolong their agony, as it turns out. But uh, now all of the sweet spots, all of the easy to drill locations, have been drilled out and pumped out. Uh, what's left is not that 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 productive anymore. The drilling rate has come down. Uh, a lot of these companies are, are bankrupt already. Um, and so there will be no resumption of shale oil. But shale oil is uh, what has been allowing the world to avoid the ravages of peak oil, which has already happened in 2005. So this has been a postponement of peak oil. And what, we're, what we need to understand is that uh, um, what, what Kunskun calls the Society of Happy Motoring that's over. The United States, the entire uh, suburban way of life, that's finished. Okay? Um, the, the entire industrial scheme that supports it, where uh, the Chinese make products and, and then Americans pay for them by printing pieces of paper for the Chinese to buy, that's over. All of these things are, are finished. They're, they're not coming back. Uh, well, we'll get onto energy in a little bit more detail in a moment, but that's just one of the many systems that you've been critical of and again paraphrasing from uh, the meat generation you talk about large-scale hierarchically organized centrally controlled systems and their vulnerability and then not just in energy but in economics you know financial sector in politics you know the eu being a good example uh, but also socially as well now as far as what's happening at the minute with the current crisis uh, of course conspiracy theories abound i've been observing two trends kind of somewhat opposing trends one is uh thinking about countries closing their borders and things necessarily having to become smaller scale along the lines you mention and some large-scale operations going away altogether a sort of a trend a continuation of a trend that was already there towards localism and shorter supply chains people on the other end of the scale are going this is going to be greasing the skids for more global control of a meta organization because you know this crisis demands it as it were so um but i personally feel this it's going to this is going to lead to more local focus um in all sorts of ways necessarily first in response to what's going on but then going forward i think many people will be very wary of getting involved with ceding control to these enormous umbrella un unaccountable distant unelected umbrella organization well uh different things are happening in different parts of the world. Uh, we have to understand that, you know, different, different large organizations and nations have very different situations, very different internal structures, uh, incomparable in some ways, and different futures. Some don't have a future at all. Others uh, will proceed the way they have been going. Some will change what they're doing in, in, in various ways, some subtle, some not so subtle. So, for instance, take China. China is, is slowly shifting from uh, 
exporting to the United States to exporting to the rest of the world. So China has been rather successfully um, making its dependence on the United States, on trade with the United States, um, sort of not as important, uh, if you will. Uh, right now, uh, about 10% of China's trade is with the U.S., uh, and it, it has been supporting a structural trade deficit. So basically it exports, it's been exporting uh, things that are actually valuable in exchange for uh, pieces of paper that aren't valuable at all and are in, in, increasingly worthless. Um, they're going to stop doing that. They've been taking uh, Americans' money and investing it elsewhere in the world. They've been doing that for a long time. So Basically, China has been a, a wealth redistribution pump, taking wealth out of the United States and putting it elsewhere. In that sense, it's been quite useful. So uh, if you look at what China has gone, uh, you know, has gone through its experience, it has proven that it has the ability to govern itself and, and it, its population is sufficiently disciplined to sustain if you will, a bioterror attack. I'm not saying that this was a bioterror attack by any means. You know, I don't, I don't buy into that because I don't have uh, the evidence to prove it. But suppose it was, or suppose it was a dry run for a bioterror attack. They have demonstrated their ability to to sustain it and 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 defeat it. And 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 so now they're back back to business. Now now they're going back to work. There'll probably be more coronavirus spikes in China, but they've already proven what, what they can do. And, and they'll do it again if they have to. So that's the Chinese ex experience. Um, in terms of the resource base, China's resource base is basically Russia and Australia. It, it seems doubtful that uh, Australia would decide to uh, not ship coal to, um, to China. And uh, Russia will continue to provide China with uh, uh, oil and gas um, in exchange for all sorts of things that China produces that Russia needs. So it seems that China is within um, a, an economic ecosystem that's relatively stable. On the other no, side you, of the world, you have sorry. the United States, which is not stable at all, which is basically, as I've sa I said this many years ago, something like a dozen or more years ago, that uh, the the United States economy is poised to perform something like a disappearing act. And now this, now it's happened. And the trigger for that is the coronavirus, although it was clear what was going on uh, last, uh, last August, middle of last August, uh, during the repo crisis, when it turned out that, that American debt is no longer collateral for a loan. As has been mentioned, the, the current crisis has um, exacerbated some trends uh, that were already underway, some of which were flagged up or telegraphed by the election of Donald Trump, and also uh, from where I'm sitting here uh, in the UK by Brexit. I think these were kind of red flags that um, a lot of people didn't pay enough attention to. I think they they kind of thought, "What's this weird blip in social and political behaviour?" But I think those were signs of. Uh, changes that were underway. And we'd seen similar sorts of changes in terms of types of politician or non-politician being elected in other parts of the world before Trump was. We'd seen more secessionary movements uh, before Brexit happened, but they were obviously headline grabbers because of the countries that were involved. So I think they were telling us something very meaningful before what's happening now got underway. Well, yes. Um, basically, the election of Donald Trump uh, was... Um uh, was a, a complete fiasco for for the for the ruling elite in the United States. Uh, here, was, here was this basically a, a very wealthy uh, semi outsider, basically barging in and insulting everyone and uh, getting elected by virtue of insulting everyone. The re the Republicans uh, rolled out this this entire panel of uh, ridiculous figures and. Trump insulted each one of them to their face and they disappeared from view because everybody just laughed because it's so, it was so apparent that these are just like worthless nincompoops, that there's nobody in the elite capable of anything at all. And, and so Trump was then faced with uh, this uh, old woman, incredibly corrupt old woman that nobody wanted to vote for. Um, and 
pretty much that was over. Um, you know, that, that, that was the moment that, you know, the, the free ride ended for, for, for the American elite. But um, it's, they're, they're constitutionally incapable of realizing that it's over. So they've been uh, doing progressively more and more degenerate things to, to perpetuate the, the notion that the status quo can somehow be preserved. Yeah, well, you could see that in the, I don't know how much attention you paid to the, dem- the election of a Democratic nominee for the presidential run in 2020, but that, that was a, quite painful to watch. And I certainly don't have a, have a dog in that fight. I mean, uh, it doesn't really make a great deal of difference either way, but it was painful to watch really because I, I used to say I could care less about Bernie Sanders, but he did seem to be someone who had a, however remote, a chance of taking the fight to Donald Trump. And then even if his policies on, it don't matter if we think about his policies being unrealistic, none of that, just on a purely personal point of view, you know, on camera, in front of people, probably had the best chance. And that yet the Democratic machine went into uh, overdrive yet again to do whatever it took to get an establishment person to the, you know, in this case, Joe Biden, uh, into that position. So uh, you think they'd have, you know, they've basically learned nothing since um, the last election cycle? Uh, It's not even a question of learning. Um, There are these institutions in the West that everybody thinks of as public institutions, but they're really just private corporations because that's all there is. So the the Democratic National Committee is a private corporation and it it has its own corporate interests. You know, basically it it raises money and, and it spends and distributes that money. Uh, it it has um, it, it is connected with uh, lobbyists and, and various other shady characters. Uh, it is it does not exist in the public interest by any means. And so, if it decides so I, that that Bernie Sanders is its enemy, then there, it ha- that has nothing to do with what people want or with uh, getting their candidate elected or anything else. It's just the machinery of this corporate organization mandates that they they go against them. You know, there, there are other similar institutions, for instance, the, uh, the uh, IOC, International Olympic Committee, is also a, a private corporation. You know, it, is, it makes a lot of money off, off of promotions and advertising and, and broadcast rights and things like that. It is fully staffed with, uh, um, uh, with, with basically with, with people who are holders of British pass- passports. No, no one else uh, needs to apply. Um, and um, it loses money when Russians win. Um, so it tries very hard to exclude uh, uh, ex- exclude Russian athletes from competing. It makes a lot of money when, when Americans or Brits win because most of their advertising base is in English-speaking countries. And, and so you can, look at, um, you can look at it as sports, for instance, but it's not. It's just corporate politics. Or you could look at... Uh, the, the Democratic Party as politics, but it's not. Again, it's just, it's, it's money politics. It's, it's corporate interests of, of the DNC. So there, there aren't any real public institutions in the West anymore. Uh, they're all private corporations. And uh, the, the strange thing is now they're all simultaneously losing money. Uh, it's been interesting to see over the last several weeks what was once very recently deemed as the, you know, the most important thing or very important, become not important at all. You know, I'm talking about obsessing over uh, distractions of, you know, identity and gender politics, for example. I did read one news story a couple of days ago. I, did, I just read the headline and the byline. I didn't get into the substance of it, but it was uh, some politician somewhere, uh, perhaps in Australia, I can't remember where, but but claiming that, uh, the, you know, the coronavirus was a sort of a, a gender or, a, you know, a, a, an identity issue or something, and it was... a, a couldn't really bring myself to read much further but it's it's interesting with the focus that uh, situations like this bring on things and how, how how that list of priorities can change extremely quickly well yes because a, a number of things that aren't real but can be used as a distraction in in quiet comfortable times or um, times without much of a disc- discontinuity uh, be- seem immediately look preposterous when, when times suddenly change and there's an emergency. So, for instance, the concept of gender lacks physical reality. It's, it's, a, 
there is no lab test to to show what gender you are. Therefore, it's not physically real. It's psychologically real, yeah. but so is uh, you know uh, so are uh, all sorts of uh, um, hallucinations experienced by uh, mentally ill people. And then if you put people in a state where um, where they 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 can't just waste their time on things that don't really exist, where they actually have to worry about survival, then all of these phantoms disappear. Um, in, in a sense, a lot of these uh, afflictions of identity politics and gender politics and all of that, th- these are just first world problems uh, experienced by bored people. And when they can no longer afford to sit around be, and be bored because they have to start thinking about how to survive, suddenly all of these problems just completely disappear. Um, you know, there's, there are a lot of similar problems. For instance, you know, there's been an obesity, obesity epidemic in the United States because people sit around, eat junk food, and watch TV. Well, um, you know, if they go hungry for a few months, then they'll lose weight. Problem solved. Um, there are lots of things like that that aren't real, and we don't know that they aren't real until there's a stress test. So now we have a stress test, and now is when we find out what actually exists and what doesn't. Well, yeah, I mean, talking about um, the, the health system there reminds us, you know, and as we have already, what a, a, a kind of a, a bubble that was, an unsustainable system in the, in the U.S. and in other countries as well, but particularly in the U.S. Education, pretty further ed- education, is another one such uh, financial bubble, and it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, the universities having become just, you know, meat grinders really for getting people in, getting the associated loan money in and getting them out the other end to, you know, to, to probably to flip burgers if they're lucky. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to the further and higher education system uh, in the US and to say other parts of the world, you know, in the wake of this, you know, as the uh, implications begin to make themselves felt. Well, I expect one thing that'll happen uh, in the wake of all these developments is that the system where foreigners go to the United States to teach other foreigners will probably go away. So the the United States hasn't been producing uh, enough, uh, you know, mathematicians, physicists, uh, other types of scientists, engineers for a long time now. Uh, A lot of uh, the jobs that still exist in the U.S. in these fields have been staffed by foreigners. Uh, a lot of them have been going back home. I don't think they'll ever go back to the United States. I don't think they'll ever send as many students to the United States to study. I think that a lot of this activity will shift back to their home countries. And uh, um, so the United States will hollow out as far as education. Sure, they'll still, they'll still be you know, fully staffed uh, gender studies departments for, for a while yet. But as far as, uh, you know, actually training people uh, to, to do specific, very important jobs, you know, that's going to go away. And that, 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 that doesn't bode well for a number of things in the United States. For instance, the defense industry is in the United States. That's, that's one place where you, have, you can't employ foreigners, so you have to employ, uh, you know, native local uh, knuckle draggers to the greatest extent possible. Um, and, um, you know, that's been failing. So the U S hasn't been able to, the defense industry in the United States hasn't been able to keep up with Russia, for instance, um, Russia can produce a better weapon system for one tenth of the cost, uh, or, or even less, uh, basically has been running circles around the U S well, this problem is going to get a lot worse. The United States already doesn't have, uh, the technical competence to do key tax such as, uh, uh, uranium enrichment and and, um, and and making nuclear fuel. Um, it's been making ever smaller nuclear weapons, which is a very interesting trend because it, it can no longer produce uh, weapons grade plutonium. And um, it can no longer build uh, nuclear reactors. All of the programs that it had it initiated over the past decade or so have been a waste of money, inconclusive. Um, so a lot of this high tech that is in the United States right now will simply evaporate. It, it, it's, it's almost over now, but it, it will definitively, de- definitively go away in the wake of this crisis. We've already talked about 
excessively complex systems. Uh, but that, and we mentioned your book, Shrinking the Technosphere. And one of the problems that we built up that's being revealed now as well is, is excessively complex technology. Now, we both benefit from technology. Technology can be a great thing. It, you know, makes possible so many dimensions of the lives that we've been able to enjoy and, you know, many millions of other people. But over reliance on excessive complexity and also complexity for the sake of it could easily be our undoing. Um, and we tend to, when complexity throws up problems, unforeseen problems, we tend to th- to try and solve them with further layers of complexity to the point where nobody fully understands the system anymore. And you mentioned military technology. I don't know if this is going back to the 70s or probably the 80s when I started to pay attention to the news, but I do remember, I don't know if it was Iran or some other country that they were at war with somebody else and the people they were at war with were using American uh, military aircrafts that were, you know, they were kind of amazing when they worked, but when they were didn't, they were a bloody nightmare. And Iran or whoever it was were flying these Russian MiGs, which were just like a simple old 1960s car or something. You'd actually get under the hood and fix it, you know, and they didn't have that many parts and what have you. So you could keep fixing them and fixing them and fixing them. And they just did the basic job, what they needed to do. And that's certainly a trend that has kind of continued. That bifurcation has continued. And you write, um, you've written more than one blog post about, I can't remember the name now of the US jet, but it did make the news as being this massive white elephant that, you know, the most technologically advanced plane of its kind ever built that doesn't work. Oh, yeah, the saga of the F-35. It's it's a remarkable thing. You see, there was a, a Russian engineer uh, who um, emigrated to the United States when the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, settled in California, I believe, and decided to do something to make a bit of money. So he came up with this theory about uh, making invisible planes by reducing their radar cross-section. So basically, the idea is that um, you uh, you perform a certain computation on the shape of the airframe uh, that allows you to determine how visible the aircraft is going to be to... Uh, to the sort of radar that's that's used in targeting systems, um, that that's for instance the type of radar that's in the nose cone of a fighter aircraft, and and so the Americans have uh, been building. They really bought into this theory. They thought it was perfect, so they they've been building stealth aircraft ever since then. These oddly shaped aircraft that aren't very useful. They don't they don't fly very well. They cost a lot of money, but radar can't see them and um so the the russians thought about this and and thought well okay so we can't see them from far away using the these small radars so let's build some large radars and uh put them somewhere just south of moscow and and um these radars are so large that they can see anything um in the air over the entire hemisphere and then uh let's not have the long distance targeting system right in the missile or right in the in the fighter aircraft let's let's put the targeting system um kind of in space so there's a satellite link from the radar that's just south of moscow to the missile itself that allows it to find find its victim so now it turns out that every single f-35 in the air anywhere over uh let's say uh most of eurasia is visible from Moscow. And it's an aircraft that costs a lot of money and it doesn't fly very well. So that, that's, that's your typical scenario. You know, it, it goes back to this kind of like difference in attitude. Americans spent a million dollars developing a, a ballpoint pen that will rise, write in zero gravity. Russians use a pencil. You know, that, that's kind of like, that's the mindset difference. Speaking of like engineers, uh, and going back to the education system, I know that if you're, for example, in the US, but, all, you know, in, in lots of other countries also, in order to go take a university degree these days, chances are you've got to find some funding. And that's probably going to be in the form of a loan. Uh, and these can be very onerous indeed, especially if you've got no guarantee of getting a good job afterwards. But I never quite understood, you know, financing aside, why you would have one or maybe even two generations now of of some young people in some of these countries not seeing, you know, engineering 
you know, our various branches of science, these useful real world things. I mean, science can be very abstract and theoretical, but there's all sorts of these practical applications. Not seeing that as a particular career path, not seeing that there's an opening here. You know, there's a dearth of skilled people going forward, just as there's a dearth of people with what I call heritage skills. You know, people who know how to grow food and know how to repair shoes and know how to build things out of wood and, you know, and have got metalworking or glassworking skills. You know, both ends of the scale there. There's all these opportunities and yet a lot of people, young people playing video games and saying, oh, there's no jobs. Well, um, the, the problems, um, the problems abound. There are lots of different problems uh, that affect young people, but a lot of it has to do with respect. So, for instance, in China and Russia, uh, first of all, uh, the, the major authority figures were not, um, were not lawyers. You know, uh, lawyers do get some respect, but, but not that much. Uh, it's really the engineers and the scientists who get a lot of respect. Um, if, if you look at who, who a society respects, who gets put on, 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 on high pedestals, those are generally the people that young people will try to emulate. So in the US, basically the, the ultimate victors are, you know, happy, shiny, fake people, uh, various types of, uh, you know, artists. Some of those artists uh, and, and television personalities uh, become elected leaders, strangely enough. Of course, they can't lead. All they can do is act. And, but, but they're sort of the figureheads and then behind them stand various shady financial types and, and, and slimy lawyers. And, and that's really the whole structure. So there's, there's, there, there are no role models. There are no positive role models for young people to copy. So instead, they escape reality altogether and, and go play video games. So this, this is, uh, this is uh, unavoidable to some extent, given the structure of this society, which is just rotten. Tell me what you think of this idea. No matter what the what is behind the coronavirus crisis, the origin of this virus, um, which of course there we have coronaviruses pretty much every year. It's just a type of virus, um, but it's new to a lot of people. They're hearing about it now for the first time. No matter what the origin of that is, if it's occurred naturally, it's just an outbreak, and we collectively have chosen to particularly focus on this one at this time or whether you entertain the uh, the thing you mentioned earlier on, this idea that it was somehow engineered or it's a deliberate move, whatever, put all that to one side. What do you think of the idea that this may be exploited or is being exploited currently to try and to move towards some ends, some goals that have more or less been stated, but that we're making very poor progress towards? That is to say, carbon neutral by 2050 or 2040 or whatever, getting uh, fossil fueled vehicles off the road, cutting consumption, you know, that would mean traveling less. You could see from an ecological, environmental, energy point of view, how just shutting everything down, maybe not like permanently going forward, but certainly, see, you know, seeing what that can achieve in terms of those metrics, it could be said, okay, well, this is what it, you know, because this is what it might take. Because the way we were going prior to this, we were just missing all those targets, you know, like CO2 emissions are going up, SUV sales are going up. Now that can't all continue, but it was for the time being continuing. So, so what do you think of that scenario? Well, uh, the virus itself is probably, you know, from bats. Uh, bats are an interesting species, species because, uh, you know, bunch of species, because they, they live in colonies oh, yeah. of millions of individuals where, uh, you know, if, if one bat get sick, all bats get sick, and the entire colony dies. So <clears throat> different species, you know, invest, um, invest their energies in, in developing various features that allow them to survive, be it sharp claws and teeth or, or excellent sense of smell. Well, the bats invest a lot of their energy in, um, in developing a completely bulletproof immune system. So they're, they're not affected by the rabies virus, for instance. They're not affected by all of these coronaviruses, this one in particular. It just passes through them. And, and uh, bat guano is one of the most dangerous things you could ever come into contact with because the, the, the number of pathogens that, 
that that bad guano contains um, is is just you know very very high. It's it's possible to get just about any kind of disease from from coming into contact with it. Um, it's really something to fear. So that's probably where it came from. Now, what was made of it was very interesting because China um, has decided to do this basically as a test of its authority, of its its ability to organize and crush this thing, which it has. Russia has done the same thing. So the the, the number of coronavirus cases in Russia is something like, um, um, I, I forget the exact number, but it's less than half a million uh, total people affected. It's a, it's a tiny, tiny outbreak. It's centered in Moscow. Uh, most of it comes from the fact that uh, people uh, have been, Russians have been uh, coming, coming back to Russia from all over the world. Uh, over a million people uh, came back to Russia over the past month or so. Um, hundred, something like 100,000 people uh, a week have been flooding in. And a lot of them have been bringing the virus with them. They've been put into quarantine. Not all of them have been abiding by the rules of the quarantine. And so they've been infecting others. But, but basically, the entire country is now under lockdown. I, you know, you can't, you can't go out uh, un- unless it's to shop uh, for food, pretty much. Um, schools are closed. Everything is closed. Uh, because it takes about 40 days for for the quarantine to work. Um, so everything will be under shutdown for a month, and, and then Russia will crush this thing. It will absolutely crush it. Um, that, it's on, on the path to do that. But uh, these are dry runs for um, basically reconfiguring the world, because this is just one minor uh, you know, disaster, potential disaster, not a real disaster. Uh, things could be a lot worse, but the world really needed to be reorganized. And one of the things that needed to go away is the United States, because it's been living on other people's dime, if you will. It, it's been uh, it, it's been subsisting uh, thanks to the kindness of strangers, if you will, um, basically spending other people's money and uh, running out of resources. And, and perpetuating a completely corrupt, uh, undemocratic governance scheme. And all of that needs to be knocked out. So basically, uh, countries that can hold it together, like Russia and China, will hold it together. And then entities that can't hold it together, like the EU and the US, will simply go away. And we will be in a brave new world where, where we will know what's what. So would you anticipate a more level playing field Whatever, however you want to interpret that, when this all shakes out. Well, no. Basically, what what we will go through is uh, a process of uh, uh, regionalizations. Uh, regionalization. So we'll have clusters that of uh, of relative prosperity and development. But for instance, Russia and China and and uh, some of their the countries allied with them will um, will go on. Uh, they they will continue. Uh, along an industrial path uh, for um, for the time being, um, possibly for hundreds of years, um, and it, that depends on various things. But but the potential is there, and then various other countries and regions will deindustrialize. Uh, if they're lucky, they'll uh, become very rural and, and uh, will will develop subsistence economies. If they're not lucky, then they'll just basically uh, devolve into, you know, some, you know, a few loners dwelling within ruins of cities. Uh, it could go down that far. Basically, large, very large cities that are full of people right now could end up as no-go zones. Nobody will know what's going on there. Nobody will report from there. Nobody will travel there. They'll just... Uh, continue to exist, but nobody will be particularly interested in what goes on there. So that being the case, you might imagine that some regions, some groupings along the lines you've described might like to be a little bit more protectionist, maybe even just in terms of like who they admit in terms of immigration, maybe even travel. Certainly echoing a little bit what I said earlier about less economic activity, less consumption. It would be easy to envisage a world with 
with less happening, certainly in terms of all, you know, the millions of people crisscrossing the globe on a daily basis? Well, yes, uh, we, we already saw the collapse of uh, tourism. We'll, we'll mm-hmm. have to see to what extent it comes back. Tourism is, is something that is uh, relatively recent. Uh, up until very recent times, only the very wealthy could go on tour. Only the aristocracy could afford to do that. And mass tourism is a very recent, late 20th century development. It could be that it's over. It could be that we'll, we'll revert back to uh, a state where the vast majority of the population uh, barely, barely moves uh, 100 kilometers from where right. they're born during their entire life, with, with a few exceptions. Uh, we'll probably still have trade. We'll probably still have uh, international shipping. Uh, but we won't have masses of people uh, flying across the world on two ve- two week vacations to to suntan on a beach somewhere in an exotic locale that could just be finished that that could that might just never come back again in terms of uh, this sort of fluidity where large groups of people migrate well they'll they'll still be migrations, but they won't be these sorts of back and forth migrations that we've been seeing. I think a, a lot of countries will be rather careful in terms of who they admit so um you know, again, you know, I live in Russia, so I notice what's going on here. Uh, the term Russian is not really a, an ethnic identifier. It's a cultural identifier. So you can be a Chinese Russian or a Korean Russian, for instance. Speak fluent Russian, send your kids to Russian schools, uh, you know, speak Russian at home. And OK, you're Russian. It doesn't matter that you, you're some other ethnicity, ethnicity to start with. Um, the French are, you know, at least historically, they, they have been similar. So they, they can absorb anybody and, and uh, anybody can become culturally French by virtue of education and, and culture, acculturation. So that will go on. But the idea that you're, you're going to admit a whole bunch of complete strangers who can then live as a separate community in your midst without trying to uh, integrate, without trying to become culturally, you know, the same as everyone else, um, that might go away. Because first of all, it's dangerous, and secondly, um, it's too expensive. Well, it's interesting. Just there was something that came to mind in, in light of what you just said was that the number—I can't remember uh, uh, what it was in the past. Maybe it's as high as sixty percent, maybe even more, um, of Americans who didn't own a passport, so therefore, by necessity, didn't travel internationally ever. So, I would rather have thought at one time. I would rather have thought that, that number might have fallen before it went back up again but it looks like it may have it may have peaked <laughs> well yes um, you know until recently it wasn't really necessary to have a passport to move to uh to travel to to canada a driver's license was sufficient um you know that has stopped around 9 11 and now americans won't will, will have to have a real id in order to board a plane anywhere uh to even to move across state lines and and so um it's, it's becoming, uh, you know, a, a lot of Americans are trapped wherever they are. And that's a, that's a I, I believe that's a trend that that's going to increase. Uh, America is becoming uh, significantly less mobile. Uh, one thing we've touched upon, but haven't really expanded on, I want to ask you um, before we bring things to a close is, is about energy. Uh, now, you've written extensively about the prospects for renewable energy, green energy, and that we don't really have time to get into all the problems with that. Suffice to say that you and others have documented how we cannot have current levels of energy consumption using um, renewables, not least because renewables are themselves dependent on fossil fuel inputs, you know, for the manufacture of solar panels and wind turbines and everything else, and all the infrastructure that supports that. So that's not going to happen. But to the extent that we can deploy renewables going forward you speak about the using existing proven technologies scaled up as far as possible and you can actually apply that to all sorts of technological applications not just energy but what you then throw into the mix which not very many people really talk about and have anything positive to say about is nuclear energy so i just want to get your take on that because for many people they feel that with nuclear energy it's been tried it, it works. Technically, it works, but it hasn't worked because it's never been profitable. You know, it was required in so many parts of the world to be profitable or at least self-sustaining. And no one has yet worked out what to do with spent 
nuclear fuel. Now that's the that's still the conventional mainline take on it, and it's very hard to find friends of nuclear energy anywhere. Well, what what I have to tell you uh, is something most people won't really want to hear, but you really don't don't need to worry about it. All you have to do is uh, sell your um, spent nuclear fuel, all of your very high grade nuclear waste to Russia, and then you won't have to worry about it anymore. Because it turns out that uh, Russia and to a smaller extent China uh, are the only two countries in the world who have it together as far as nuclear. So uh, Russia is working very hard on a closed nuclear cycle, which will produce minimal waste um, and will will make nuclear fuel out of uh, depleted uranium by irradiating it within a, a fast neutron reactor. There's one in operation at Belayarsk already. Uh, it's, it's making electricity that is expensive, but uh, still competitive. So it's useful, economically useful. Um, yeah. And, and uh, it, Russia will probably continue to go on doing nuclear. Um, we'll probably suck in all of the spent nuclear fuel, reprocess it, make it into new nu- nuclear fuel, uh, burn what remains within the same fast breeder reactor so that uh, uh, basically what comes out is something that's safe enough to be buried. Um, Russia really needs to build uh, around 10 nuclear reactors a year in order to eventually transition away from fossil fuels, uh, at least to a large extent. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they succeed. At the same time, if you look at uh, all of the nuclear industries in other parts of the world, the U.S. has lost the ability to construct nuclear reactors, plagued with, uh, not only plagued with cost overruns and delays, but not actually delivering. So there are a lot of mothballed projects that you know people throw money at, the government throws money at, but uh, nothing comes out the other end. And and uh, things are not much better in um, in Europe, where the only uh, the only country that's been able to make uh, the latest generation nuclear reactor, European nuclear reactor, work is China. There there may be one in France that uh, might actually get commissioned at some point. That there's been uh, one being built in, in Finland that's taking a, a ridiculously long time and, again, costing too much money. So basically, you, you're right that uh, people have lost the ability to make money with nuclear, uh, but that's in the West. That's in the West. And also, it's worth considering, and it you know, should give people pause for thought, that uh, given what we just said about the prospects for renewables... And I'm not saying that we, that the party just has to roll on, the, you know, the, the techno industrial party just has to roll on like there's no tomorrow and nothing should change. But if we want to keep the lights on going forward, um, across great swathes of the world that currently benefit from electricity, that as things stand, there, with the fossil fuel depletion situation as well, that nuclear is kind of the only game in town for the time being, pro- pro- possibly forever. Well, it is in certain parts of the world that have uh, basically um, managed to hold on to uh, their, their state-run nuclear industry, and that's Russia and China. The ones that have privatized their nuclear industry, you know, forget about it, that doesn't work. Um, and um, so there, there are really no good options except keep, to keep burning fossil fuels, but, uh, you know, burn less of them. Uh, renewables, wind and solar in particular, uh, uh, if you, if you subsidize them, then they exist. If you don't subsidize them, they disappear. Uh, they vanish. Um, they just don't get maintained, uh, at public expense. Uh, it's too expensive. Um, and, um, uh, if, if the share of, uh, wind and solar in, in power generation exceeds something like 20, 30%, then the grid falls apart um, because it, it's ragged generation. It goes up and down. To compensate for that raggedness, it's, it's, uh, it's necessary to have uh, standby sources of power, mostly based on natural gas, that are expensive and inefficient. So the entire system is basically double what it needs to be or triple what it needs to be 
to produce the same amount of power. And it's, it's just basically, it's a prescription for having either incredibly expensive electricity that will preclude any sort of industry or uh, the, the grid will just fall down and there'll be just constant blackouts and things will fall apart. So the renewables are sort of a poison pill. You know, they, they've, just, they've been discovering that uh, basically the UK has, has ended up with very high electricity rates. Germany has done the same thing by shutting down their nuclear reactors and coal-fired plants and, and going with wind and solar. In Australia, they, they basically ended up in the same situation where uh, at, they, they continued to add solar in, in, uh, in Western Australia to a point now where the entire grid in Western Australia is in danger from, from disruptions. So, you know, none of these things actually work. Uh, people buy into them because they sound good and they sound green. But if you look at the technology and how it functions, it turns out that, first of all, it's not green at all. It produces a lot of toxic waste and it actually wastes a lot of energy on, on all, all of these hot standby installations that, uh, that basically are spinning just in case, you know, there's a cloud in the sky or, uh, or the wind dies. And you also do a comparison, a simple, straightforward comparison with the, the damage, uh, the negative cost of having used fossil fuels um, for all the time that we have, uh, you know, well-documented documented issues, comparing that with generally, you know, environmental or other problems uh, caused by using nuclear energy. Now, of course, melt, melting down reactors, that's a, a clear problem, an extreme example. That has happened it may well happen again in future. That is to be avoided at all costs. But I think you're referring to the, the, the general day-to-day functioning of nuclear versus fossil fuels. Well, yes. Uh, uh, the, the only thing that can be done that's safe as far as spent nuclear fuel is to, to sell it to Russia. And Germany has been doing that. I think uh, the United States has been doing quite a lot of that as well because um, basically Russia is what is, is the one of the main fuel reprocessors in the world. They're the only ones that have this technology end to end. Um, but what, what a lot of uh, plants in the US and other places have been doing is, is uh, basically just put it, putting their spent nuclear fuel in, in, a, in a pool uh, at the reactor site and, and, uh, and leaving it there, um, which is long-term a very bad idea. There have been some other plans. There's one in, in Finland. There, uh, there was a plan in the U.S. Uh, around uh, uh, Yucca Mountain uh, for long-term storage, and none of these schemes really seem to be particularly useful um, or or workable. So th- there there aren't really any solutions except for the Russian closed nuclear cycle scheme, which seems to be on track but is taking quite a long time because the technology is difficult. Uh, a couple of closing thoughts, uh, Dimitri. You've written extensively in the past, including uh, your book Five Stages of Collapse, about how the some of the uh, crises we faced in the past and like the one that we're currently going through, they do present uh, the opportunity for broad cultural change, ideally why, while avoiding the worst extremes uh, that can happen at these times. So uh, just in a nutshell, and you've already d- described some of this, but who would you, if you were sort of like uh, on a, imagine you're on a, a, a evening news show and it's a panel and they're just going around. So who would you expect to be to coronavirus winners and losers in general? Um, I don't think there will be any winners. Uh, I think that it, it, it will surprise us in terms of uh, how it will reconfigure the world. Um, I, I'm not a betting man. I don't make bets, especially not on the results of disasters such as this. But um, I do expect that the healthcare system in the United States will get knocked down. Um, I do do expect that there will be major political fallout from the fact that the the European Union has proven itself to be completely useless in a crisis. I will believe that NATO doesn't really have any legs. Because again, it's it's just a, basically you know a camp full of um, uh, nincompoops, if you will, just useless burners of, of money. Um, 
that, that are experiencing endless phantom pains over the loss of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. You know, it's, it's been 30 years. They should try to get over it. So all of these things are definitely in the works. Okay, and lastly, you've also written a lot about how individuals can survive and maybe even thrive in the midst of turmoil by by going their own way against the herd, against the grain. So just leave people with a couple of thoughts. You know, what, what if you were saying to someone, given what's happening now, going forward, maybe maybe look at these areas of your life, think about this, consider this, um, you know, have you thought about this? Well, um, I think a lot of people uh, are locked in kind of a, a, a loop where they, they're forced to make money uh, because they have habits that require them to have money. So uh, there's, there's a huge amount of freedom to be gained by by lessening one's appetites, by, by, uh, by, by reducing consumption. And uh, now that everyone's under lockdown, it's a really good time to look at what you've been wasting money on and realize that maybe you could just be, be just as happy by consuming a lot less and working a lot less and having a lot less money in the future and, and not go back to the same grind once things pick up again. Dimitri, we've mentioned a couple of your books, but all your writings are generally available at people's favorite bookseller. Before we sign off, tell listeners about where they can find you online and anything else you'd like to put out there. Uh, yes, my, my main blog is Club Orlov at .blogspot.com. And uh, I, I publish some, uh, some articles that are publicly available and uh, some articles that are behind a paywall. I have a lot of subscribers and they, they find it, you know, very useful to be subscribers. Um, and I find it very useful that I have some subscribers because I actually, you know, get a little bit of money for doing what I do, which is helpful. Uh, so please join us. Splendid. Well, once again, Dimitri, thank you so much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. All right. Well, thank you very much, Greg. <laughs>